I know. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, I was going to say it's a beautiful day, but it's really not, is it? It's kind of rainy like it's been for the last, you know, all the days. And, uh, but is it supposed to clear up? Are we supposed to be able to have fireworks this evening? Unfortunately for my dog, yes. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, Well, uh, welcome. It's good to be here. It's good to be, uh, to be able to, to be together again, to be worshiping in this space. It's good to know that this is our normal again, that we're going to do this every week, uh, live and in person, uh, that we're going to be here to to share together, to sing, to pray, to praise, to bring ourselves to God, and to acknowledge all that God has brought to us as we worship together. So welcome. uh, You're welcome in your Father's house. It's good to be here. Um, There was something I wanted to say. What am I supposed to say next? Does anybody remember? Our announcements? Oh, yeah. Thank you. That's the teacher in me. <laughs> uh, just a few announcements. Um, if I don't, the, there had been a, a, a study, get their, uh, get their name, that I had been advertising for both churches through New Hope. Um, we're going to put that on hold. It turns out starting a weekly, uh, a weekly study in the beginning of summer was a miscalculation on my part. <laughs> So we're going to put that on hold because I think it's going to be a valuable study, and I'm inviting both churches to join in it when we, when we uh, resume and we, we pick it up again. But for now, we're going to put that on hold. Um, and again, I just want to remind you that we're going to be here every Sunday, that we're coming to this place again to worship. Um, we are going to share communion together. Uh, we're back. So uh, every Sunday, you know, I hope to see you here with all of your happy faces. And, you know, all the coffee that it takes to make your face happy at this time of the morning. Um, are there any other announcements? There'll, there will be very light refreshments afterwards. There will be light refreshments if afterwards. If the coffee pot works, we'll have coffee. Right? <laughs> knock, knock on wood <laughs> if the coffee pot works. <laughs> well, we'll, 16 months, so 16 months. we'll have faith. I think we can do it with faith. Um, let's express our faith. Uh, let's join, stand if you're able, let's join together and sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
join in the call to worship. Great is the Lord, and greatly should God be praised. The fortresses of the Lord cannot be broken by human hands. Though the kings of the world assemble the vast armies of mankind, they will tremble at the foot of the mountain of God. For the power of God is infinite. Let's pray together. God, we are amazed by your love, that even though we have not earned your grace, yet choose to forgive our disobedience and return to us only blessings, love, and grace. Give us the will to go deeper in our relationship with you and lend us your strength so that we can bless the world in your name. Amen. Amen. And we, uh, we give thanks to God. We give thanks for God's presence with us. We give thanks for God's blessings with us and God's unconquerable grace. Let's sing together number 2036 in the faith we sing, Give Thanks. be seated. 
we truly do give thanks for all that God has given us. We give thanks and we celebrate that God's grace is made manifest in our midst and that we are a forgiven people. And we strive to live into all that God expects of us and all that God calls us to. And yet we know we're going to fall short. We know we're going to fail. We know that we're going to find ourselves maybe not doing exactly what it is that God would have us do. Um, but we also know that we can go to God and confess the ways that we've fallen short and ask for God's forgiveness and that forgiveness will be there for us all times in all circumstances without reservation. So let's bring a confession before God this morning, acknowledging that we are not always the people that God wants us to be, but we are always the people that God loves. Let's pray together. God of everlasting strength, who created the mountains and the seas in their unfathomable strength and power, and yet overpowers them all. Lend us your strength this day, because we have been weak. We have not loved as you have loved. We have not forgiven as you have forgiven us. Lend us your spirit, Lord, and help us to be more like Christ, not only forgiving, but also blessing in your name and in his. Amen. Let's take a few moments for those prayers that we keep silently in our hearts. So much of a surprise is it that we aren't always as Christ-like as we would wish to be, as Christ would wish us to be. It's no surprise because, surprise, we're not Jesus. We're not perfect. But in Christ, the way is open for us to be something new, something greater. If we choose to accept, Christ offers us mercy. Christ offers us grace. Christ offers us salvation. In Christ's name, we are a forgiven people. You are forgiven and I am forgiven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're forgiven. Let's sing the glory and the grace of God. And we are still, of course, existing at various stages of comfort as we emerge from this pandemic. So with whatever stage of comfort you are in, let's pass the peace of Christ with one another. Peace be with you. Our uh, 
Our scripture reading this morning is from Paul's second letter to the churches in Corinth, chapter 12, verses 2 through 10. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into that paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of this scripture. Thanks be to God. Well, first of all, let me, uh, let me wish you all a, a happy 4th of July. I hope that the weather clears up, and I hope that we all have an opportunity to go out and celebrate uh, the, the freedoms that we sometimes take for granted, the, the gift that is not only the gift of, of being in this country, the freedom that we experience as people in the United States of America, but also the freedom that is God's gift to us and God's desire for us. Um, so happy 4th of July. Um, I don't normally uh, celebrate secular holidays in church. I, I prefer to stay with the lectionary and, and, and bring, uh, hopefully, these sometimes confusing words into, into light in that way. But I do, uh, I know that we have some good plans for today. If the weather clears up, we're going to go see the Steeple Cats play and see the fireworks and enjoy a day of baseball and, you know, probably hot dogs and all of those things that both celebrate the traditional freedoms of this country and also give us large amounts of indigestion. So... Uh, we've got that to look forward to. Uh, but right now, um, we've got this to look forward to. These words that Paul wrote to the churches in Corinth, and whatever they, may, they might mean. And, uh, and I want to bring it to you on the, uh, in, under the umbrella of the, the phrase, it ain't bragging if you can back it up. You ever heard that phrase before? It ain't bragging if you can back it up. I've seen it at various points attributed to different people. I've seen it attributed to Muhammad Ali, um, but uh, a couple other people. And as far as I could tell, when I spent way too much time on the internet figuring this out, <laughs> we fell into one of those rabbit holes, you know, you search for one thing and the next thing you know, well, never mind, anyway. Um, as far as I could tell from my far more exhaustive research than I actually should have done, the first person who ever spoke this phrase, at least in public, at least recorded, was Dizzy Dean. Dizzy Dean was, a, you probably know this, a pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals in the 30s. He was a great talker. He's one of these guys who's full of sound bites. I'm sure if he was pitching today, he'd be on ESPN every other day saying something witty. A couple of stories about Dizzy Dean to illustrate the kind of person he was. One famous moment involving Dean occurred in the 1934 World Series. Dean was put in as a pinch runner. And uh, the next batter hit a ground ball. It was a, a tailor-made double play ball. And so Dean, not wanting to run into the double play, threw himself in the path of the thrown ball from second to first. The ball hit him in the head, and he fell unconscious and had to get rushed to the hospital. The next day, there was a quote from Dean himself that appeared in the newspaper that said, they x-rayed my head and found nothing. <laughs> I could probably think of some other people for whom that might apply. <laughs> Dean was famous for his antics on the field also. One year, uh, there was a bet between himself and his brother Paul, who was also a pitcher for the Cardinals, that together they would win 45 games. So on, uh, there was a night that Dean threw a three-hitter in the first game of a double-hitter, 
His brother threw a no-hitter in the second game. Um, and uh, Dean said, oh, gee, if I'd have known you was going to throw a, a no-hitter, I'd have thrown one too. <laughs> there was a game he said he was going to strike out Vince DiMaggio four times. So the th first three times, DiMaggio, Vince, Vince, not Joe, Joe and, and not even Dom, but Vince DiMaggio. Uh, but anyway, he, the first three times Vince came to the plate, Dean struck him out. The fourth time, DiMaggio popped up, and Dean yelled at the catcher to drop the ball so that he could pitch to him, struck him out the fourth time. There are a lot of stories like that about Dizzy Dean. Most of them have to do with Dean talking about how great he is at the game of baseball. But as he said, it ain't bragging if you can back it up. Dean's career was cut short by an injury. It only lasted 10 years, but at the end of his career, he finished with a 3.02 ERA, 150 wins, 1,163 strikeouts. He's the only pitcher in the National League since the live ball era of the 1920s, at least until, you know, since they started recording this, he's the only pitcher in the National League to win 30 wins in a season. In his 10 years, he won a World Series, an MVP award, was selected as an All-Star four times. He's in the Hall of Fame, and his number 17 has been retired by the Cardinals. It ain't bragging if you can back it up. Today's epistle comes from a longer section of Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth that we know as the fool's speech. Uh, since Paul left them, the church in Corinth, Corinth had fallen under the influence of what they, they were calling super apostles, right? Um, Paul was lovingly trying to lead the church back from their influence and doing so uh, in such a way as to avoid provoking a fight with these super apostles because they were all working toward the common goal. And so in this full speech, um, at other parts in the speech, Paul asks the church to bear with him as he lists out his pedigree as an apostle. He describes to them why he is, he, Paul, is a superior apostle. He spends an entire paragraph explaining why he's about to explain why he isn't inferior to the super apostles before he goes on. He says, uh, they're all Jewish and so am I. He's saying, this is why we're the same. This is why we're both, you know, credentialed for this. They're all Jewish, so am I. They're all Israelites, so am I. We're all descendants of Abraham. And then he lists out kind of his resume uh, of ministry for Christ. I've done more than them, he says. I've worked harder. I've been imprisoned more. I've been beaten way more times than they have. I've been in danger of death. I've been flogged five times. I've been beaten with rods three times. I was stoned once, you know, with rocks. I was shipwrecked three times. So on and so on. But all the time he's doing this, he keeps referring to himself in a derogatory way. Uh, he says, uh, I'm talking like a fool, he says, or I'm talking like a crazy person. I'm speaking foolishly. He's embarrassed, not by what he's done for Christ, but he's embarrassed to be talking about what he's done for Christ. He doesn't want to brag, and he doesn't want to boast. And you may ask, why is he so embarrassed? I mean, it ain't bragging if you can back it up. It ain't bragging if you can do it or if you have done it. Why does he spend so many words so carefully downplaying his own acts? When the passage opens, Paul is, when this passage opens, Paul is talking about a person in Christ that he knows who was basically raptured, right? Who was either in the body or out of the body, brought up to heaven, saw paradise, and was taught things that he could never repeat. Now, most Scholars seem to agree that Paul, you know, knows this person the same way sometimes people ask questions for a friend. You're familiar with this, right? Like, if you're on vacation, is 8 a.m. too early for a glass of wine? Asking for a friend. <laughs> or if I really intend to exercise later, is chocolate an acceptable breakfast? Asking for a friend. Is it weird to sing Yacht Rock at the top of my lungs while I'm riding down the street on my motorcycle? Asking for a friend. Me, I'm, I'm the friend. In that case, that's, that's me. Um, and it was Paul, right? All of this is to say that this person that he knows is Paul himself. And yet he diverts and deflects and says only that he knows someone, not that he himself has, has experienced this thing. Why is he so, what, shy? Modest? Self-effacing? I mean, it ain't bragging if you can back it up. Why doesn't he take credit for what he's done? I think we can find the answer, at least part of the answer, in the Gospel of Matthew. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. 
No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to, to whom? Give glory to your parents for having raised you right, to you for having done these incredible things, for your teachers for having taught you. Give glory to whom? Your pastors and Sunday school teachers for having instructed you on the ways of the gospel? In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they see, may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Paul doesn't take credit for the work that he's done because he hasn't done the work. Only God can take credit for salvation. Paul wouldn't even have described this amazing experience he had attributed to himself or to anyone else, except that he wanted to use that experience as a light, shining on a lampstand for all the house to see, a light that would help others to see and to glorify God. It might not be bragging if you can back it up, but the truth is that uh, well, the truth that Paul demonstrates in this passage is that we can't back this up. No matter how much good we've done, no matter what service we've rendered to our sisters and brothers, no matter how devoted and dedicated we are as disciples of Christ, all of all our work falls far short of the work that was done on the cross. The work of salvation belongs to God alone. I mean, not that we don't take credit. Not that we don't brag sometimes about having some sort of extraordinary connection with or to God from time to time. I mean, everyone here has seen televangelists, yeah. right? Uh, a lot of pastors preaching to the multitudes through today's men, or uh, through today's media, are genuine women and men of God who simply want to bring others to Christ. But we've all witnessed or heard about those others who may have gone astray. I guess sometimes, now it feels like we just call them megachurch pastors, right? Once they were televangelists, now we sort of lump them all together with megachurch pastors. New words, but doing the same thing. Does this sound familiar? Write your prayer concern on the memo of a check for $1,000, and God will hear and answer your prayer, <laughs> right? Uh, give $2,000, and your job is safe. $2,500, and your wayward child's coming home. You remember Harold Camping? You remember this guy, Harold Camping? Harold Camping uh, was a... I don't know how you classify him. A priest, a pastor, a teacher, a theologian, I don't know. But there were four or five times that he gave specific dates that the world was simply going to end. And he claimed that he had those dates out of his special relationship with God. And every time one of those dates would come and go, he would be like, oh, I misread the sign, it's actually going to be this date, and bump it further down the line. But shortly in advance of each one of those dates, didn't thousands of people divest themselves of the money they were no longer going to need by sending it to Harold Camping? <laughs> There's a, I, I've told this story before, but I just love this story. There's a self-styled bishop of a six-campus evangelical church somewhere in the South who decided that he needed to upgrade the church helicopter. <laughs> Hear that. The current helicopter wasn't fast enough. He needed to upgrade the church helicopter. So he told his congregation that through his special connection with God, anyone who gave $52 to the helicopter fund, in addition to their regular giving, right? Anyone who gave $52 to the helicopter fund would receive the transportation mode or car of their dreams from God within 52 days or 52 weeks. This was national news when this happened. This actually happened. What do you think was larger, the number of people who got the car of their dreams or the number of people who actually gave the $52? These people, they boast of this special and incredible relationship with the Creator and their Savior, but, but they can't back it up. Believe me, I understand the attraction. I get that people love to live in the idea that God is directly in touch with a person down here. Like there's a phone I can pick up and be like, Hey God, can we talk about this? I'm holding my phone upside down. <laughs> I'm going to... Yeah, okay, anyway. Uh, there, the idea that there's somebody who can pick up the phone and talk to God is a wonderful idea that God is speaking to a person and telling them what the plan is, instructing them on times and dates and schedules. If, there were, uh, if that were happening 
it would be incredible, real, and powerful, and undeniable proof that God is actively and obviously working in our world on a daily basis. It's comforting to know somehow, to know that the Creator is here actively thinking about humanity on a daily basis and to have proof that it's happening. But this is what Paul knows. A, a disciple doesn't boast about his or her power and influence, but rather uses their experiences and their faith not to impress others, but to guide others into their own unique relationship with Christ Jesus. I have a, a friend who is... Uh, who claims that she can see angels, that she sees and talks to angels, you know, wings, halos, harps, the whole deal. Um, I have never myself seen an angel in that manner. I've seen plenty of angels who are human beings. I've seen plenty of angels in our midst. But I've never seen the feathers, right? I've never heard the harp. Um, I don't have any reason to not believe her I've never seen them. It reminds me of a story from a television show about a little girl who sliced open a tomato, and inside the flesh of the tomato formed a perfect rosary. And there were priests and pastors and people saying that this is an exceptional little girl, and the main character of the show said that he thought it was an exceptional tomato. <laughs> My friend, she claims to see angels, and though I have never seen an angel, I don't doubt her claims. I see her faith, and I know her faith. I hear it in her prayers and in her words. I have no reason to doubt her because she's not boasting when she says she's seen angels. She's testifying her faith and using her faith as an example of her experiences to try to lead others into a relationship with Christ. In many ways, actually in many ways she's a remarkable woman, but not in, not in this way. In this way, she's not a remarkable woman, but a blessed woman who is witnessing to the power of a remarkable God. We shouldn't boast about our faith, our encounters with God, our relationship with Christ, our lives in the Holy Spirit. We shouldn't boast about our deeds, the ways we've helped people, the ways we've served our sisters and brothers, the ways that we've shared our faith. We shouldn't boast because ultimately we can't back it up. None of this is our doing. I mean, yeah, we have to be open to God and the Spirit and we have to accept the gift, but it's God's gift given to us. Like Paul, we shouldn't boast about our deeds, not of our strength and discipleship, but about our weaknesses. It is for us the same as it was with Paul. Though we are weak, though we may desire strength, the voice of Christ calls to us from Scripture and reminds us, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. When we stop relying on our strength and put ourselves in the hands of Christ, we have access to his strength which is so much more than ours could ever be. When we admit our weakness and rely on Christ's strength, then we are strong. Another way to say this, another way to say this isn't our own weakness, but our openness to God's strength. Our openness to the understanding that God's strength, God's grace, and God's mercy are beyond comprehension and unparalleled in power. So let's not be fools. Fools boast of their strength in Jesus and their power under God, but they can't back it up because none of us have any strength of our own, but only what we receive as a gift from Christ. So let's not boast. We've done nothing in the world that would earn us the grace of God, so we have no reason to boast. Rather, let's use our experiences to guide others to Christ, but remember that the heavy lifting, the real work of salvation, was done by Jesus on the cross and in the empty tomb. And it is such a blessing because we who have received on that, that gift, we know that we can rely on that gift. We are weak, so we cast ourselves on Christ and we grow strong. These super apostles that Paul was struggling against were, you know, like Harold Camping and Bishop Hillard and all the... And his church's aviation department, right? In that letter he wrote to his church, he said, in consultation with his church's aviation department. Let's just chew on the fact that his church had an aviation department for a moment. The super apostles were like the rest of the charlatans who claim to have the undivided attention of God, who claim that they have got Christ on speed dial. They bragged to the people they saw God, they walked with God, and they possessed God's strength and God's power. They boasted, but they couldn't back it up because they had no power. The only power we have 
is our openness to the revelation of Christ and the presence of the Spirit and the power of grace so that we can be filled up by the strength of God and used for God's purpose as a light before the world shining and guiding people and walking with them ever onward into the life in Christ that really, truly is life. Amen? Let's pray together. God, you are the light of the world, and you have called us to also be the light of the world, not hiding under a bushel, but shining for the world to see. Give us the strength to not boast. Give us the strength to remember that we can't back it up, but you can and you always will. Give us the strength to rely on you so that we can help others to rely on you through us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Relying on Christ. There's never been a smarter choice than that. Uh, and Christ is made manifest in our midst in so many ways. We are so blessed to know Christ's spirit, to have Christ's love, to understand the gift of Christ's salvation, even if we can't always understand the words of the apostles who conveyed them to us. And this table is the ultimate manifestation of that grace. This table in which Christ is made manifest in our midst, in which Christ comes to us to be in this body of worship, to be at the table with us, to share a meal, and to remind us that God is present in and through all that we do together in Christ's name. So this table is open to everybody, right? This table is open to everybody. You don't have to be a member of the Pauline United Methodist Church. You don't have to be a member of the Methodist Church or the United Methodist Church. You don't have to be, you don't even have to be a Christian. This table, what John Wesley called a converting ordinance in which we feel the grace of God made manifest to us can be the moment that we all open ourselves to a deeper commitment or maybe even a first-time commitment to Christ. This is Christ's table and all are welcome at this table. Um, we are going to serve communion by intinction today, which means, uh, first of all, I'm going to ask somebody to come up and hold the cup um, so that I can hold the bread. When you come forward, if you're comfortable doing this, obviously there are, you know, we're all at wherever we are right now, but if you feel comfortable coming forward, I'll tear off a piece of bread and give it to you. You'll take the bread and dip it into the cup and then eat the bread. And then we'll just form a line down the center aisle and move forward like that. Um, can I... Could I ask you to hold the cup? Thank you. Um, and uh, this is Christ's table, so let us prepare ourselves to dine. I used too much. <laughs> For those of you who can only see the, uh, what is being projected, the reason this is taking awkwardly long is that I put too much hand sanitizer on, and now I have to wring my hands until the hand sanitizer is worked in. <laughs> Excellent. This is Christ's table. And all are invited to come and dine at the table of Christ. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce the time had come when you would save your people. 
He healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, shared it out among his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, shared it out among his disciples, saying, Take and drink, ye every one of this. For this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this every time that you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, God Almighty, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as you forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one. The loaf in which we partake is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blessing of Christ. The table is set. Let all who wish to dine come forward. Let's pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. 
Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Do we have any prayers we'd like to share this morning? I'd like to um, ask for prayers for Bernadine Williams in Williamstown. She has been diagnosed with brain cancer. Bernadine Williams. She's only in her 50s. Oh, wow. We ask God to be with her and give her strength and healing and a reminder that God's grace is sufficient. Um, But we just pray that God be with her and with her care professionals and give her strength and healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Carl, did you have something? Donald Washburn? Did he live in Bennington? Did he live in Bennington? Okay. For uh, Donald Washburn and his family, uh, we ask for God to be with him and his family and give them grace and a reminder that there is always joy after mourning and that God forgives all and wipes away all ills. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I would particularly like to offer prayers for everyone in harm's way this morning, for all of the service people who have sacrificed and continue to sacrifice in in, our, uh, in the name of our freedom and for freedom throughout the world, we honor their sacrifice this Independence Day as we celebrate the gift that has been given to us by so many of them and their brothers and sisters in arms who are in harm's way and who have made the ultimate sacrifice uh, for us and for our country. Uh, we ask God to be with them and give them grace and mercy today as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's pray together. God of infinite grace and mercy, we are here this morning reminded of your power and our weakness. Reminded that we have no strength without you. And yet you are ever there to give us the strength that we need. We ask that you embolden us this morning, that you give us that strength to be your lights shining out into the world, helping others to walk in their journey to life in Jesus Christ. We ask that you embolden us and strengthen us to stand tall in the face of injustice and oppression, to be voices of reason in the face of chaos, and to be bearers of love in a world that has so much hatred. These things we ask of you, God, as we we lift them up to you, as we lift up the prayers that we've spoken this morning, um, for those who need healing, for those who need your compassionate mercy, for those who are in danger, and for all of those who are suffering from uncertainty, addiction, who are suffering from abuse, who are not sure where to turn or how to turn there, we ask that you be with them and give them comfort and strength as well. Lord, there are so many things that we wish to pray for. We can't speak them all aloud this morning. And some of them we, we don't dare to speak aloud anyway. But we ask that you look into our hearts and read the prayers that are written there as you've heard the prayers we've spoken aloud. We lift them all up to you, knowing that you are present and active in our world, even if nobody has your direct phone number. We ask that you give us your grace and mercy, that you Give us your compassion as you have always done in the name of Christ. Amen. Uh, are we passing the plate? Did we decide on that? It's still at the back. It's still at the back. It's still at the back. All right. Well, there's, if, you, if you'd like to make uh, an offering, uh, there's a collection plate in the back of the sanctuary, or uh, you can send an offering to P.O. Box 4, right? Yes. Um, in uh, Pownal O. Oh, Five two six one. <laughs> Does Powell really have two zip codes? Yes. yes. I mean, isn't it this? Okay. Oh, is it zero? So it must be four or zero. Or you can go to uh, powellumc.org and use the online giving form for secure online giving through PayPal. Um, and I guess we'll uh, we'll celebrate the gifts that we have given or the gifts that will be given as we stand together for the doxology.
Let's pray together. Lord, we humble ourselves before you, acknowledging our human weakness and your divine strength. Thank you for bringing us into the light of salvation and inspire in us the desire to reflect that light out on the world so that all might see and come to Christ. Bless these offerings. May they bless those who gave and those who will receive, always remembering that the blessings come from you, even when these gifts come from our hands. Amen. God is here with us. When we don't feel strong, God is our strength. When we don't feel that we can stand, God is holding us up. When we don't feel like we can take another step, God is carrying us forward. We don't have strength because we don't, well, and we don't need it because God gives it to us. So let's remember not to boast. Uh, it ain't bragging if you can back it up, but we can't back it up. But we are backed by the one who can always back it up. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and abide with you forevermore. And all of God's children say, amen, amen. I wish you, as we go out into this day, the peace, the shalom of God. As we part this day, let's sing together shalom to you.